Which is uh, looking at reusable components and a d design system to help government make things accessible. So I'm going to hand over to Alice, to Ed and to Alex that are going to talk to you about the Gov.uk design system. So I should start off by saying thank you to Charlotte and James for a really interesting talk. I think it helps set the scene for some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about. Um, and I guess it's just kind of a nice bit of context. Um, before I go any further, I should probably introduce myself. Um, I'm Alice Noakes. I work at Government Digital Service, or GDS, um, as a product manager. Um, so GDS is best known for building and maintaining GovUK, which looks a bit like this. That's the website for government. Um, but GDS is also responsible for supporting and enabling great digital services for the rest of government. So supporting and enabling teams like the ones that we've seen um, the work from at the Home Office in the talk before. Um, and we do this by providing some tools, so reusable components, uh, guidance, um, and support, and just uh, kind of a, stru a, a structure to help the rest of government build really great uh, citizen facing and other types of services as efficiently as possible. Um, I'm here with two colleagues, Ed and Alex today, and we're gonna talk about a very small piece of the work that GDS is doing at the moment um, uh, to do with the design system. Um, so I'm gonna kick things off with a little bit of context about the design system, GovUK design system, and Ed and Alex are then really gonna talk in detail about some of the work that we've been up to, how we've embedded accessibility into to the kind of design test iteration of patterns and components that are gonna go into the design system. So I'm a product manager and product management 101 is to start by understanding kind of the problem that you're trying to solve or the needs that you're wanting to address. Um, and the problem is illustrated by this slide. Um, and I don't mean the services that are listed up here. So we've got things like booking a prison visit, applying, uh, applying for carer's allowance, um, to uh, understanding your immigration status. I don't mean those services. They're not the problem. But it's the scale of, of that thing. Um, government is made up of all these different types of things, booking something, registering for something, reporting something, applying for something. Um, and it, government and all these things are the things that services see and interact with. So that we were talking just now about uh, applying for a passport, for example. It's also all the stuff in the background that the citizen doesn't see, all the stuff that civil servants do on a day-to-day -day basis and all the tools that they also use. Um, and there are well over 700 services like this that are linked to from GovUK, just that website alone and beyond that even more. And they account for over 3 billion transactions a year. So we're talking about something at a really like, large scale. Um, and because government is big, each of those services is being built at, any, at, at some point, designed or maintained by a team um, in a different department, different departments, lots of different teams. Um, so inside government, we know about all this complexity, but outside government, citizens only really know government is as, as a single thing, a single entity. So that's a bit of a problem. So with that stuff in mind, we've got some needs, and those needs are uh, really that all services need to be built efficiently. They need to be consistent with GovUK, so they all look the same and they look like each other, um, to help citizens not have to feel that there are different bits of government that they've got to interact with, there's just one thing. And they all need to be usable. Um, they need to be efficient because we are, as civil servants and contractors in government and various other things, we're spending taxpayers' money um, and we need to get the best value of money out of that thing. So we need to make sure that services can be designed and built quickly. Um, services need to be consistent because we know that that builds trust with users and when you're interacting with government, trust is a really important thing. It also means by being consistent that users don't have any hurd like, you know, things that as they expect. They don't have hurdles and barriers to, to what they're doing. And they need to be usable because, as we've heard from the Home Office team, uh, government services need to be accessible and uh, inclusive for everybody. Um, so that's, that's great. But we know that every, if, if, if somebody in every single one of those 700 kind of services, every 700 of those service teams are all trying to do this thing, that's a lot of duplication of effort. And that's not great. That's not really helping with the efficient, efficiency piece. We also know that not all teams have the time and tools or expertise to build services that are of the same high quality standard, the same kind of consistency, and that maybe they're not really that accessible. Um, 
So that's kind of the problem space. That's this kind of area that we're, we're talking about. And this is where the design system, GovK design system comes in. So what is a design system? Ala Kolmatova, who last year published a book all about uh, design systems, describes it as uh, a set of connected patterns and shared practices that are coherently organized to serve a purpose of a digital product. So for us, uh, in the center of government and supporting the rest of government, that translates to something that looks a bit like this. So this is the home page of the design system. But for us, that type of thing means that the design system is the building blocks that help designers and developers to deliver sites and services as quickly and efficiently as possible. And it also so it includes design elements, open source code, guidance, and it's also the support that sits around those things from a team of people to help services prototype, service teams prototype and build government services. Um, so in a little bit more detail, the design system and, and Ed and Alex are going to come on and talk a bit more about this in a little bit, so I won't talk too much about it. Um, it's reusable and accessible components for forms, um, panels, tables, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's also design patterns that are at a slightly higher level. Design patterns are suggested solutions for common user tasks, like helping a user fill in a form, for example. Um, and those things are all kind of sitting in a context of a framework and a service. Oh, come on, clicker. Uh, sitting in a kind of framework or a service that we're, the design system is trying to support teams like the Home Office team to share their work with the rest of government to try and reduce that duplication of effort again. So here we're looking at um, a kind of a backlog, a Trello board kind of a thing um, that is from, uh, that we're hosting in GitHub that we have put in place to help uh, teams across government to make their work visible, um, to make their work so they're working in the open and are able to collaborate and share on moving, say, a button uh, component or um, a drop down or a type ahead through from a like initial idea, working together to get it into something that is proposed and, um, and then finalised and available for everybody in government to use. Um, so going back to the kind of needs and the, the, the thing we're trying to do, um, it, what, how does the design system actually help us tackle this need for government to be building things efficiently, to be making the, the most usable, accessible, um, consistent services possible? Um, first up, the design system helps us uh, solve problems once. So it's dealing with that piece uh, about efficiency. Um, by the design system makes it easy for service teams in government to find uh, kind of common solutions to common problems. Um, by providing reusable components and patterns, service teams can prototype, test, iterate, and actually release services to government citizens faster um, and getting those things to citizens where they need them. It's also helping to increase the consistency of the way those things are designed because if you can provide things uh, kind of that are easy to find and easy to get into use, people are going to use them, and that means the consistency across different services uh, is, is much better. Um, so the design system also provides accessible building blocks. Um, so we just, in the previous slide, we're looking and talking about uh, being able to provide, um, uh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought, solving problems once. So um, if we're providing common solutions, we can make sure that those things that we're providing to everybody um, have things like accessibility baked in from the start. Um, all of the components in the design system have been rigorously researched, tested and iterated um, to meet really high standards, so W3C, um, AA and above standards, so really striving for the best in um, accessibility. Um, and in the design system, we're clearly communicating uh, how those components have been made accessible and the standards that they've been tested against. So we're kind of really trying to um, push the need for teams to be making sure they're thinking about these things at every stage. Um, I talked a little bit about the framework that we're making sure that we're building the processes and um, kind of uh, systems that we're putting uh, around the um, patterns and components. And I guess the most the, the most crucial thing here is um, that we have spent a lot of time thinking about the engagement and support that we need to provide. Um, that kind of really gets a community involved in, in uh, kind of building in an accessible way, building in a consistent way. Um, and I guess we can't do that by ourselves. 
it's down to a community. People uh, who are working as designers and developers, we've got lots of those in the room, user researchers and others, people like you. Um, we as digital, pra digital practitioners are learning all the time and we need your help in pouring some of that stuff into the design system. So we've been really thinking hard about how we can work with you as a community, others as a community, to kind of keep adding components, building on accessibility, improving things over time. Um, so I guess that's really a call to action. Uh, a possibility for you guys to get involved here and people beyond. Um, you could just use some of the stuff in there when you're building um, services. Um, there are ways of making this thing so it's not just for government. This thing is totally open to anybody to reuse the code, reuse the guidance um, that we're providing. But you could also suggest something new. You could tell us about a time when something didn't work, so some user research findings that actually says this could be better, this could be improved. Um, or you could contribute a whole brand new thing, and we would love that. Um, so we're still in private beta right now, which means that uh, some of our stuff is still behind a password. Um, but it's very easy for us to give you access. Um, so if you'd like to know a little bit more, or even better, want to get involved, um, you can drop us a line. So there's an email address up on screen right now. But if you just want to kind of stay tuned, um, you can also just watch the GDS blog for updates and changes. Um, and we're kind of, kind of quite active on Twitter if you want to follow any one of us. Um, and, and watch what we're up to. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand over to Ed, who's going to tell you a little bit more about some of the work that we've been doing to actually embed accessibility into the patterns and components that are kind of the core part of the design system. So thanks, Ed. Cool. Thank you. <coughs> so I'm going to be talking a bit about building accessible web components. Click, click. So they look a bit like this. And for much of last year, whilst uh, much of our design system team is working on how do we kind of package up and deliver these so that many services across government can use them, I was kind of focused on with a few other developers, what are those things? And if we, as a team, are trying to save other services from doing things many times, can we do like these small components really well so that they can just be reused uh, quickly? So things like checkbox uh, inputs, buttons, and previously, we only were kind of working on patterns one at a time. So I came and talked to this lovely group here about six months ago about our autocomplete. And that's where myself, a developer and researcher, kind of worked continuously on autocomplete for a few weeks to kind of make sure that was really worked well. And before that, we'd done some work on TARSIS and check eligibility. And these have worked really well, but they're also quite time consuming. And like for a bigger pattern, for something that's a bit more tricky for accessibility or tricky for building, it kind of makes sense to spend quite a bit of time on it. But for small patterns, it didn't really seem to make sense to like spend so much time on each one. So something we wanted to try last year was working on more than one pattern at once. And then when you work on more than once, being able to test them all together in kind of one big round of research. And this was kind of an experiment for us. We didn't know how it would work, but I think it was quite successful. So part of that, we made a long list of patterns. I think on our backlog, is, there's a good few hundred. And it's a bit daunting when you look at it. So there's a long list of things. And some of them are really big. Some of them are like potentially years of work. Some of them are maybe a day or two of work. But even the day or two of work, if it's used by hundreds of services, it's still really relevant for us to take a look at that. Um, so we prioritise those based on effort required, value and accessibility. So sometimes even the smallest things, we might actually think that's the thing we should do because if there's a particular accessibility challenge there, why make every team discover that or perhaps not discover it when we can do that and it could just be used easily. And I guess interesting for this piece of work, we wanted a set that would work together in a single prototype. So something that could, we could, we could like kind of choose a service and test coherently uh, with a group of users. And so the ones we ended up picking for the research last week were these. I'll read them out. Uh, so autocomplete, uh, doing more work with the autocomplete we did last year, currency input, character count, date picker, loading spinner, numeric input, task list, timeouts, and timeout warnings. Uh, so often things that are quite common in government, some of them have particular accessibility challenges, some of them, some of them not many challenges, but they, we just want them to be more consistent in government. 
uh, like many things at GDS, one of our first steps was to go out and meet some of our users. In this case, our users are kind of service teams. So we went out and met with many government departments and looked at kind of what patterns they're using, what do they want to be using. Sometimes, like some of these patterns like, uh, on the previous slide, they want to be using, but there wasn't an accessible version. So like we could learn about the needs they had. Uh, kind of example, these are six different types of task lists we found in that research. So this was a pattern in use, there weren't any particular accessibility challenges with it, but there was a huge amount of variety and we'd like to make that more consistent. Other ones did have accessibility challenges that we wanted to tackle. Um, and I guess the other thing was then like wanting to test in context. Uh, when we did the autocomplete, that was just a single field and when we tested it with users we asked what was the last country you visited? And they could use it fine, but a lot of them were a little bit like, wait, is that it? Like, well, what, what's the point of this service? Because a service of one field is a bit weird. Um, so something we really want to try this is like, what if we put them all together in a coherent service and then users aren't really, they're not really aware we're testing this one thing. They think we're testing the service. We don't really care about the service. We care that the patterns work. And after quite a bit of searching, we decided to go with temporary event notice. Uh, so this is a thing that's actually done with your local council, and it's a thing where you, you apply for a temporary event, no, no, you apply for a temporary event notice when you're holding a temporary event. So maybe you're a party at the end of a football season in your village green, or a pub wants an extended opening for some reason. And we kind of picked it for a few different reasons. Um, it's somewhat non-controversial for us to be testing with. We don't want like to piss anyone off while we're doing this. Um, it's also are quite easy to recruit for. Any, any member of the public might end up needing to do this if you're having a wedding, if you're having an event. And it had quite a good mix of patterns that we might be able to then use to test with. Um, something we then did after that was to hold a workshop with members of GDS staff to look at how do we kind of marry, we want to build a service that's realistic enough to our participants so that they think they're testing temporary vote notice, but we also want to make sure that it tackles all the different sorts of scenarios we want to test when we're testing these patterns. And the one I'm going to talk to you about is character count. So it's kind of really like a very mundane thing, but it's because that's the great thing about working on these patterns. Most service teams can never spend that much time on some of these smaller patterns because it's, it's just not the important thing. Whereas we can spend a bit more time and look at it and then hopefully solve it once. So it's a component that indicates character limits and lets the user know how many characters they have remaining. And the first thing I should say, point one says, is the best limit is no limit. So we would normally advise service teams, don't limit your fields, or if you do, make sure it's at least as long enough so that the majority of users do not reach the limits. But if you do have a limit, it's kind of important to tell users what that limit is. The other thing we found in our research is there's kind of two scenarios where you are likely to have limits. Uh, one of those is that you're working with legacy system, and for whatever reason, the legacy system only allows 100 characters for that field. Uh, normally, we'd kind of ask teams to try and work to change that legacy system, but as Charlotte has alluded to, that can be a slow process. So in the meantime, you need to tell users what's happening. And the other slightly interesting case is there are certain types of questions where users will always fill up whatever amount of space you give to them. So if you give them a paragraph, they'll give you a paragraph. If you give them a page, they will give you a page, even if the, even if the question only really needed a paragraph. And that's something to do with some types of questions where the user wants to feel like they've given you a complete answer. And for those ones, you do have to set a limit because people will just keep going and going. And if you, really, if you only need a paragraph, but a user's giving you four or five pages of content, that's wasting the user's time and it's wasting an examiner's time. Um, so again, many services already have character limits, and I kind of said character limits rather than character count because at worst some of them would just not let you type beyond the limit, but wouldn't give you any kind of error message, so users didn't know what was going on. Some of them maybe did let you type past the limit, but as soon as you click submit you get an error message, perhaps you've lost all your content. Uh, better ones had like a counting down thing, and of the ones we looked at, only one had done any work to kind of make it look, work for assistive technology. So done any work so that, say, a screen reader could actually pick up on what the limit was. And we weren't aware of any usability research into people's understanding of character limits. When you do go over the limits, what do they think has happened? What can they do to correct that? Um, 
So this is what we came up with, and I'll kind of describe it and then some of the reasons it got to where it is. So as you're typing in the box, there's some grey text at the bottom that counts down in number of characters remaining, and then when you go over the limit, it counts, ca counts up in number of characters you've gone over. The text goes red, the text goes bold. When you're over the limit, the box outline turns red and you get a left red border. Um, one of the other things we did is when you go over the limit, it kind of highlights the text that's over the limit and kind of shades it in pink. That actually is something that didn't test so well in research, or it tested good well for some users, not so well for other users, so we might remove. Um, the first version we built of this wasn't so obvious. So the first version I designed just had the grey text at the bottom, and it stayed grey when it went over. And I guess one of the challenges we had is that that wasn't very noticeable. So many of our participants wouldn't see it. They go over the limit, they get an error, they didn't really know what was going on. So we kind of tried to make it as noticeable as we could, whilst also not making it too noticeable. Um, and the reason I say not too noticeable is because the most important thing on this page is not the character count, as much as I love it to be, it is the question that this field is asking. So we don't know the context that this component is going to be used in, but almost certainly character count is not the important thing. So it's important that we aren't taking grabbing attention for the screen, we are just a small bit to help you use the page in, in aid of answering the wider question. Um, and something else I should also say is we allow the user to type beyond the limit because our research has shown that many users will often compose their answer in a separate document and then want to paste it over into this. And if you artificially truncate the field, they potentially lose a lot of their content. They might not even notice that, and that's really bad. At least this way they can edit it down. Um, I also might also point out I appreciate it's an incredibly short limit on this field. It's kind of a, the fun thing of testing. So absolutely in real life, we'd have a much longer limit, but in testing, we want to force nearly all of our participants to come across the limit, which meant increasingly short limits to the point they got very frustrated, but uh, kind of worked well for us. Um, and now Alex is going to talk a bit about the build. Okay. Hi, I'm Alex. Uh, I'm a front-end developer, uh, part of the design system. I'll try and look it here. And I'll go through the build process uh, of this component a bit. So the first thing uh, that we did when we started to build uh, the components for each one of them was to define accessibility acceptance criteria. And uh, this is uh, not only helpful uh, to describe the behavior of the component in relationship with an assistive technology, but also helps us to have uh, some sort of a contract of common language uh, between designers, content designers, and, and developers, uh, and user researcher uh, while uh, uh, testing this component. So this is an example. Uh, this is the acceptance criteria uh, for the um, character count. You can see that it includes uh, probably yeah, the first uh, four of them are generic, are, are uh, criteria that you can find for a text area. Uh, and we also added two of them which are particular for the character count. Um, uh, what's important about these things is that they should be uh, technology agnostic and they shouldn't describe um, the design in any way. Um, the first uh, actual programming step uh, is to, to start writing a semantic markup. And at GDS, we do use progressive enhancement uh, as, a, as a rule of, of developing things, uh, and which means that we're starting by writing uh, only the HTML, and we're trying to make sure that uh, the services are running uh, just as well uh, without JavaScript or, or other assets. Uh, and this uh, a building with accessibility in mind um, fits very well into this, uh, into this strategy uh, because uh, we're, write, we're writing semantic markup, which is the first step, uh, is afterwards enhanced by, by adding accessibility attributes. Uh, in our case, uh, our, the character count is, can be split into three uh, elements, uh, the label, the text area, and the additional information message. And I should probably ask this, uh, how many of you consider to be f familiar with HTML? So almost all, <laughs> which is good. So we can build it together then. Uh, so translating, um, 
uh, that uh, image that we ju we've just seen, uh, the component, we will have a label, we'll have a text area and a paragraph or, or a span uh, to, to be used for the additional information. Um, by doing semantic markup, uh, it means that we're uh, defining a relationship between the label and the text area, which is done uh, with the for and the IT attribute. And only by doing this, uh, this semantic write-up, we have uh, the minimal um, setup for an accessible component. I'll try and see if this works. Okay, maybe not the mouse. We improve this package. Edit text name. You are currently on a text area. So this will give us, I think, the first three uh, bits uh, which are uh, inherited from, from any uh, text area. Uh, if the screen reader is set up to, to be in reading mode, uh, the user will eventually see uh, the number of characters as a paragraph, but it's still an impediment. Uh, but I think it's better than not having a relationship at all. So it's, it's a good start for us. Uh, let's see again. Uh, the next step is to enhance it uh, by using area attributes. Area stands for accessible rich internet ap uh, applications. And these area attributes uh, are a set of uh, attributes which uh, allow ac um, accessible technologies um, to, to read uh, or, or to make the components more meaningful for excessive, assistive technologies. I think we could put it this way. Uh, in our case, um, we added uh, an area attribute to the text area, uh, which links it to the um, um, additional information uh, element. We used area described by. There are two options here. To, you can use area described by or area labeled by. Uh, the advantage of, of uh, using described by is that the additional information is being announced uh, after uh, the type of the, of the input, which is a slight difference. So by enhancing it, we will have something like this. How should we improve this page? Edit text, name. You have 200 characters remaining. You are currently on a text area. So this will be the minimum. Uh, what this doesn't provide uh, is uh, giving you live feedback while you're typing uh, in the text area. Okay. Uh, the third step uh, is to make the dynamic content, ac content accessible. Uh, we also have another uh, area attribute, which is area live that we can use to inform uh, assistive technologies that uh, the content uh, in, in that element um, uh, will be changed or is, is up to be changed. Uh, by using Area Live and by updating um, the content of that element uh, using JavaScript, uh, we will give them um, this constant feedback on the, on the remaining characters. Uh, Area Life has um, three options, uh, polite, assertive, and disabled, I think so. Um, the, the difference between them, between the polite and the, and the assertive, is that polite is uh, waiting for the user to, to make a small pause uh, while they're typing, so it's not being uh, aggressive or is not going over his, um, his, his inserted text. Uh, if we were to use it in an alert, we probably the best way is to use area assertive, so they can be announced immediately, so they don't um, they don't continue or the, the action is being is being blocked. So the final version of the three three enhancements will be this one. Hope it works. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure it helps. No. Nope. Uh, yeah. So I, I can describe it maybe. <laughs> so yeah, while typing, uh, the the message at the bottom uh, was uh, updated constantly, uh, as the as most of the assistive technologies and screen readers uh, essentially are doing. 
uh, the, uh, the letters that you're typing in are being announced, and when you make a, a pause, uh, then the, the number of the remaining characters uh, is being uh, read out uh, to the user. Okay. Uh, and the final step was to uh, build uh, variations for the user research. S and these are three of the variations that we prepared uh, for, for the research. We tried uh, to have um, a threshold percentage after which uh, the number of remaining characters is being announced. Um, we tried with the highlight, uh, which creates that dimmed red or pink, as Ed said, um, highlight uh, over the exceeding characters. Uh, and we also tried to integrate it with the existing uh, validation design, which is uh, the left red bar uh, on the left side. I think that third one, if I remember well, was actually uh, prototyped uh, during user research. Okay. Uh, some of these prototypes and some of these features um, are not uh, as easier to be uh, to be built. For example, for the highlight, uh, and none uh, none of the text areas or, or the uh, input elements allow uh, marked uh, text inside. So there is no way to do that uh, by using standard HTML components. So what we had to do for for uh, this one was to build an additional container. Uh, which was mimicking um, the text area content and all the behavior and the, the scrolling, um, the styling, in order to to be highlighted and uh, position that backwards uh, in order to have a final uh, text area with, with highlight on it. Um, after uh, developing, I think it's probably half of the uh, of the work, uh, because the other half comes from uh, testing and uh, adjusting things or fixing things for, for different ones. So I'll go through each, uh, each of the testing steps that we did. Uh, the first one is the cross-browser testing, and, uh, which includes uh, mobile testing and different operating system testings. Uh, here we also have challenges with JavaScript, uh, because um, some uh, Browsers uh, are using different event listener models, so they beha behave differently, so we'll have to, to um, be able to, to cover them all. Um, the cross-device testing, we don't yet have a, a device lab at the GDS, but uh, we managed to test with all the major operating systems and browsers. Um, and we also did user research uh, using mobile devices, uh, mobile phones and tablets. Um, test with keyboard only, which is something we, we uh, do often with the components, but I think it's uh, even better to do it when you have the components uh, part of a, of a service. Uh, and testing with accessibility checking tools, uh, we, have, uh, we, we have tested with uh, Wave, Tenon uh, as, as browser plugins, but we also uh, included X in our uh, continuous integration system. So we're doing this sort of testings for all the components every time we, we do uh, a change. Uh, we have the assistive technology uh, G, uh, lab, which was set up by the accessibility team. And I'll have to thank to Richard. I think I've seen him around. Okay, And Annika for setting it up uh, for us and uh, explaining how to test with, with them. Uh, we do have uh, quite a broad range, and I think they're they're covered. Uh, they're covering the um, most often used uh, assistive technologies. And the final one is to get expert assistance and conduct a formal accessibility audit. We're preparing to have uh, an external accessibility uh, audit for for the design system in the upcoming weeks or months, probably. Uh, since we don't have a user researcher for <laughs> today, I'll go through the user research findings quickly. Um, we did a test with real users. We had uh, 17 participants in four rounds, which included uh, experience uh, service users, in our case, temporary event notice, uh, low digital confidence users, and users with, uh, with assistive technology needs. Um, 
some of the findings uh, were that the, the verbal character count, the one uh, that's being picked up by the screen readers, were, was uh, really well understood. Um, we learned that users rely on a mix of assistive technologies. We're usually testing them separately, or we're trying to mix two of them. Uh, but we've seen people mixing them up to three or four, um, which was for, for us, we, we learned from that because now we're trying to, to try and mix them uh, as much as we could. Um, being too verbose uh, actually makes it harder. Um, from the test that we've got, um, the, using the, the area live polite uh, was enough uh, for uh, for a user not to be interrupted uh, by the uh, updated uh, number of, of remaining characters. Um, after those tests, um, I found on, on Safari, on the latest version of Safari, that's being read out more often. Uh, and we were uh, we have the discussion about that, and we were thinking about uh, being in charge of of the timing and when when that message will, will be read out. Um, basically just overriding the uh, the area life it's a discussion it's something that's up uh, up for for discussion before actually doing it for sighted users um, some of them did not always notice the message uh, and some of them were not sure what the highlighting feature was um, in the first case uh, we didn't see that as much of a problem because after submitting the form, they're being uh, announced with the same error. So uh, all of them eventually um, got the message, but none, all of them from, from the first time before submitting. Uh, on the second one, we still want to do more research uh, about the highlight. Uh, uh, I think one person uh, ha confused the highlight feature uh, with a spell checker. And we're trying to find out if it's something that happens to other people, if it's something common, uh, or it was just one, uh, one case in research. Uh, what's next? Uh, we're trying to build more components and patterns, uh, have more engagement, uh, more support, and potentially more contribution. Uh, basically, we're trying to scale. And uh, on the previous components, we did uh, user research with people uh, recruited uh, to, to fit the, the service. And right now we're working on the design system, uh, which requires uh, people from across the government. So if you want to help us uh, with the research, please have a chat with us uh, after the presentation. Uh, you can see our long email address at the bottom <laughs> that you can use or you can just chat with us. Uh, so yep, yeah, that will be it. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, so we do have time for questions. So we thought we had to be out by nine, but if we're definitely out of the building by half past nine, we're allowed to, to stay for a little bit. So, uh, let's have some questions, but yeah, please, please, please make sure that we're all out by half past nine, so. And questions for James and Charlotte as well? Uh, yeah, let's, yeah, so if anyone's got any questions, either for this talk or for the previous talk, please fire away. Uh, question Second over. Row, fifth row. I'm Peter Abrahams. I've been in accessibility for some years, but I'm basically retired now. Um, what are you going to do about the fact that um, patterns you have today are going to be superseded by better patterns in the future? How are you going to deal with consistency with old technology and future technology? Um. I guess, well, for us to keep things up to date, that really is um, the role, well, working with the community to make sure that the things that are in the design system are the most up to date. So that isn't necessarily something that our team will do. We really want to be kind of taking the best practice from around government and feeding that in because uh, that's where the best learning is happening right now. Um, on the kind of legacy side of things, 
we know that yes, legacy services do sometimes exist for a long time, but lots of things are refreshed on a fairly regular basis. And some of those things are just not problems that us as a design team needs to tackle. That's probably something that we might look to uh, teams in the home office and elsewhere in, in other departments in, in government to actually be kind of maintaining their legacy if those things are um, kept over time. Um, I guess that's how we, uh, it is a real problem and we know that that's a thing, but I guess at least if we're providing tools that are um, kind of centrally located, there's one place to come and look for when an update's made. Um, and the tools that we're providing, uh, thinking about, and something that we've been bad at before is just maintaining those things, actually giving people upgrade parts and other things um, that would allow them to change those stuff over the time. Would you add anything? Sure. Um, so my question was um, where you've got a design system that's made up of these modular blocks, you can't really get, you can't always have an idea about what context they're going to be used in. So I was curious as to if there are any common accessibility pitfalls or challenges that you encountered when people use several of these patterns together. Do, do either of you want to <laughs> cover that? You, you asked when, if we got challenges when they are being used together. Is yeah. that the question? The combination of them. Exactly. It's really fascinating to see kind of, you know, what, what you should look for in one specific component. Mm -hmm. But maybe, you know, when you put them together for a specific purpose or a specific journey, whether there are extra things that people often yeah. misuse. So I probably glossed over it really far too fast. Um, but we are, so the design system has lots of the small building blocks. But it also has something that are like a level up um, that we are calling design patterns. And that's how you can construct different parts of those components or put things together um, at as high level as a user flow. So taking somebody in a, an accessible, sensible, usable way through a whole form. And so there is lots of guidance um, that would kind of give people um, and give teams that kind of confidence that they were doing things in the right way. But it does still come down to the fact that we are able to help people save kind of um, time and uh, uh, kind of complexity by putting those things together, but it's still up to those service teams to do the research to make sure they're actually using the right thing um, and that the, the component that they've chosen actually does the job that they need to. And if it doesn't, by giving them something else that they could plug in quickly, you're kind of allowing that test and iteration to happen much faster. I think, sorry, I would say. Um, <laughs> So we're doing quite deep research on this, but we still expect all services to be doing regular research. And so they might not be going into the same level of detail as we are for some of these components, but they will be testing the whole. Um, one of the other things is we have kind of a, one of our core principles is something we call page per thing. Yeah. We tend to only kind of ask one question on a page. It, every page is kind of focused on what's the piece of information you're trying to get from users. And that's because users are far more successful in getting through and completing services when they only have one thing to focus on. A lot of government asks often quite difficult questions that users might struggle to understand. If you focus on only one thing, you can make that a much easier time. So it possibly happens that we often don't have that many things going on on the page. Uh, so I'm not think I can't actually think of any time when we've had that kind of conflict. Yes, I think one one thing per page would, would answer your question. So we weren't in a, in a position to place multiple components, at least not multi -compo multiple components that we were testing in the same page. So I think that would that eased a bit this uh, this kind of. Uh, I think I've certainly seen finding. cases like the autocomplete. We did find a serv some service wanted to do. They were doing something crazy. It was like 500 autocompletes on a page. But it wasn't like a government, it was an internal thing and they were kind of hacking around and there were some use cases we have not foreseen. Uh, character count, there may be a page which needs it three of them because it's a, I don't know, a complaint form and we would expect them to work mm -hmm. for that. Uh, thank you. Me? Hello, um, this is Adi Latif from AbilityNet. Um, thank you so much, two really valuable presentations. Uh, I'm a screen reader user myself and um, when you were going over the, the character count, I was thinking, when he started off, I'm thinking, yeah, but will it tell me when I'm getting near? And he eventually got to that. So it was really insightful. It was a really, really good example. My question is, are these components available to use um, for the general public? So for example, if, if, if I'm working with a corporate, say someone in the private sector, is it something I could point them to if they wanted a good example of an autocomplete or a character count, for example? I'm sorry if you might have mentioned that. 
Um, yes, absolutely. All code that we produce is open source and available on GitHub. So anyone is free to use it, free to suggest modifications, put in bug fixes. Also, there is a good separation between the functionality and the design. So you can you can just get rid of the design, use yours, and and use the the functionality of it. And you can also contribute back if you find something. Definitely contribute back. <laughs> Hi, I have a question about um, one of you mentioned about acceptance criteria, yep. the like list of things for the character count. I guess I wanted to find out more about that, as in who would read that, how is it put together, uh, we, en we ended up uh, having that list uh, by having a group discussion with the content designer, the uh, interaction designer, and the developer. The researcher which, too. And the researcher, which is why I said it's some sort of a common uh, agreement on the contract. And this is why we're trying to not be technically oriented, not be design oriented. Uh, and it also helps uh, a lot while, uh, while testing. The character count is quite a, a small or medium component, but if you, when you have a more complex component, it's very useful uh, to use these criteria when you're doing tests with different assistive technologies. Uh, also, what we're trying to achieve is to use this um, uh, criteria to define the tests. So if, if, for example, you want to reproduce the component in a different language by writing the same tests and looking for the same things, you will achieve uh, the same behavior from the component. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, I'm uh, Catherine Moonen from Sainsbury's and uh, I work on the uh, pattern library team Luna, I'm an accessibility consultant and uh, first of all I wanted to say thank you to uh, everyone who did this presentation, the one before, and the, the, just the amazing diligence and passionate work that is coming out of Gov UK teams, it's incredible. And uh, when on the Pattern Libraries, we, we're constantly looking at the dot .gov examples to see what you know, best practices, and we know it's been user tested. And we came across something recently. It's going to go quite deep. Ned, I've spoken to Alistair about just putting this question out to everyone on the community. And what it's about is that at the moment, when you go on the passport office website that we talked about before, and you're using a screen reader, you hear invalid entry before you've typed anything at all and the thing is is that it's actually um, it, our code is compliant so we're using ARIA in the correct way we're supposed to use it and lots of uh, international accessibility experts say well you should leave it like that because it's an issue with the screen readers and the browsers just leave it don't hack it whereas my personal opinion is, is this is quite dangerous for screen reader users and uh, I, I'm sorry it's such a sort of nerdy deep dive question but it's something that is causing me a lot of anxiety. <laughs> so I'm just wondering if you or anyone else has any thoughts or suggestions on it? Uh, I think our approach in development is to always follow the standards and when we have cases and we had uh, with, with the assistive technologies uh, either because they're not following standards uh, or because there are old versions of them and they, they are still there being used by, uh, by people. Uh, we're trying to write the code for the standards and uh, write something we, which we call additional uh, scripts or packages that will deal with these kind of things. So in the future we can get rid of them and, and keep the, the standard version of them. I think there have also been cases where for one reason or another, sometimes the things we want to do haven't. Um, I guess the standard is not necessarily best practice for usability, or we find issues. In that case, sometimes we've actually tried to get, say, uh, the W3C working group to make changes. So I think we've recently got a change in, was it legend inside, a heading inside a legend or he legend yes, heading? Yes, it's working. Also, by working with, uh, with the standards to, to change things if, if that's the case, or even with, uh, with the one that are producing the assistive technologies, these are even better ways of, of, of dealing with it. Uh, but not, not always, they are very open to, to do that. But working with the standards uh, is one thing that we're, uh, we're trying to do. And also, I think uh, the accessibility team uh, is involved. 
uh, in, in improving uh, the accessibility in the web. And we, we also, as a team, uh, raised one, uh, one change for legends and uh, headings. Great. Well, I, if anyone else has come across this issue that I'm talking about, I'd, I mean, I may not have time now, but please do come and talk to me or, you know, because I'd, I, I, you know, this is the latest version of NVDA with the latest version of Firefox. This is, this is happening with, and, you know, I, I yeah, I think it's, it, it's quite worrying, you know, um, yeah, yeah. Some, sometimes they are contradictory. You, you can make it work with one version and you'll broke it with right. another and, and the other way around. So uh, there is a very fine balance when, when you're dealing with, uh, with ATs, especially if you want to cover a broad range of, uh, of versions. But I think that's also one of the really exciting things about having like a central pattern library, because mm -hmm. if lots of people are using this and lots of people are pointing out things that are wrong with it or things that can be improved, the whole community can make this better. So this is where we absolutely want feedback, not just from developers, but from end users, and to work out how we can make these things as good as possible. And that might be from the usability, but that might also be where we have to get in touch with a vendor or a supplier and get them to fix their browser or get them to fix their assistive technology. Um, so yeah, help us do that. Yeah. Any more questions? So we've probably got time for two more questions. Hello, my name is Jean-François. Um, I'm a designer and, and um, uh, do a bit of development as well. And I'm, I'm really excited to to see how you went about doing this and the interplay between um, prototyping and testing. And I found it really, really interesting. And in particular, so when you showed the um, the patterns in code that affect the user experience in different ways and having that knowledge at the beginning, I found, I found it really fascinating and very useful. So, I think you mentioned a couple of times um, that you like others, if possible, to help um, go through these patterns. And I'd love to know, in, idea, in an ideal world, how you'd like people with design or development skills to help you, or if there is a way of working that you'd like, um, that is in, maybe in place or that you in, in, like to use. Do you have an answer to that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're we're using GitHub uh, to to make our code open, and uh, most of the contributions are coming as pull requests. We're trying to publish not only the code but also the tool that help you uh, develop and test them to make it easier for us to contribute. Uh, we have a contribution guideline and and, and style guides for uh, for the CSS and the JavaScript to, to make it clear from the beginning, uh, so you don't have to adjust your code afterwards. Uh, so I think yeah, the best way is to get in touch with us, uh, look at the components or something that's uh, interesting or at, in your, yeah, you want to use it in, in the future. Uh, and then just uh, raise a pull request uh, in GitHub with, with your change and we can discuss on it, we can uh, enhance it if it's needed and eventually we can, we can get it merged it's very helpful for us to have this kind of... Uh... I guess, I'm, I'm, I was trying to think of this, I'm, I'm imagining it could be helpful for other people. I'm, I'm guessing if I was, if I, if I said, okay, I'm gonna make it a priority to try and help what you're trying to do because it sounds useful. So there is that, that stage of collaboration when you, you essentially submit, a pull, you submit um, some code and you get it reviewed. So at the level of a code review, and I think I understand how that works. But imagine that another barrier for someone to volunteer and try and help would be just to yes. get the domain knowledge initially. Like for example, if I imagine if, if one of you three went to tackle the next um, pattern on this list, mm -hmm. you'd embark this with um, a, quite a lot of knowledge already, or maybe access to people who could tell you, oh, this is where it's used, do this, don't do that, don't go down that avenue. And I wonder if there's any way to get knowledge before or to get feedback before it's coded. So that is exactly um, what our concept of the backlog is for. It's to, before anything gets coded, before anything is kind of written up, it's a place where when something is just in a proposed state that anybody within, within reason could kind of make a comment against something that's listed there. So it could be a small item or something quite large and say, here's some research that I've done or when I tested something like this or something that solves a similar problem, this thing happened. And so it's a way of making really small contributions that, like you say, add to that 
much broader picture because actually lots of us don't have that background and that's kind of the point of bringing these things into a central place is that it's drawing on lots of those different things because there is a level of abstraction that happens to make something that is able to be used in lots of different services but having some of that sort of like divergent thinking about how you might go around tackling a problem before you kind of um, converge on an answer is really useful. So as a very first step, it would be taking a look at, at the backlog, which is a GitHub project, and potentially saying, oh, actually, I know a bit about one of these things, and saying, oh, hey, I tested this with three people, and this thing happened, or, or anything like that. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? In which case, please put your hands together and say, oh, was well, there another question? Sorry, oh. <laughs> Sorry, Al. Made you run. Hi, um, my name's Ben, design leader at Hackney Design. Um, it was, going back to your forms, I mean, I'm a big fan of having single step forms, so you, you, know, you just present people with one thing at a time. Um, but you've, in terms of you know, how someone's gonna navigate through it if they're just tapping through the keyboard, whatever, um, and I will go and look at how you've done it. Um, but do you find that having that extra, um, you know, the, not the CTA, but the, 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 the skip to the next form adds, you know, length to the journey? Is that a, I guess that kind of get in the way in any way? Or? So going through multiple pages does result in more clicks, yeah. but generally that's not our priority. Our priority is can users get through and is the completion rate good? Mm. So, and do they understand uh, what they're being asked to do? Yeah, do they understand? So generally, the actual total time is not something that is a high priority to us. It's much more what's the completion rate like? Do they understand the questions? Are they struggling? What can we do about that? Great, thanks. Cool. Uh, I feel like a rock star. Um, if you can uh, put your hands together and say a massive, massive thank you to Ed, Alice, and Alex.